I now want to introduce a close friend of mine, close friend of the Urban Age family, uh, Saskia Sassen. Saskia is the Robert Lynn Professor at Columbia University. She's a member of its Committee of Global Thought. In fact, one of its co-chairs uh, has been very closely involved at the London School of Economics and many other the institutions uh, which are part of the Urban Age since, in fact, it's its inception. Uh, she's written, uh, written uh, many, many, many books, uh, effectively credited with inventing the term global cities a few years back, uh, which has now become, of course, commonplace. And while yesterday we had Neil Brenner, who wrote a book, Implosions, Saskia has just written a wonderful book called Expulsions, uh, Brutality and Complexity in the Global Economy. She's also written an essay on the themes that she's going to be talking about in our newspaper, which I hope all of you have picked up, but make sure before you leave today you take a copy with you. But please join me in welcoming our keynote, Saskia Sassen. Well, it's a great pleasure. How many years have we been doing this? 13? It lasts longer than many a marriage. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I must tell you, I was very excited. I just arrived, uh, so I'm a bit half dead, but there is one half of me that can work. I was very excited with this morning's discussion because I've been obsessing about territory, territory territorialities, etc., and the question of land. And what I want to talk about today, and I have a clock because I know there is very little time, is some new research that I'm doing, and the title who owns the city uh, is part of that. And when you, when you look at, at the type of data that I look at, which is rather sort of encompassing data, you see that there are about 100 cities. And the number is growing and growing. You know, every month it seems that another city is added that are destinations of rather significant amounts of real estate investment. Now, lots of buildings are being bought, lots of industrial sites that can be made into buildings are being bought. And my question is, at what point is all this buying of buildings actually the buying of urban land? And of course, this morning we talked about land grabs of all sorts. Much of this investment produces mega buildings, urban tissue, little streets, little squares, little buildings. But in other words, a density of people rather than a density sort of, of buildings. Uh, that is part of the urbanity of a city. And when that is sort of overridden by a mega project, there is a privatizing of a bit of city and there is at the limit a de-urbanizing of a bit of that city. And so the question is, when you see these rising numbers, and I will show you some data, at what point are we really talking seriously about a kind of privatizing and de-urbanizing of large sectors of a city? Uh, now, New York, London, sure, they, they have long histories of being destinations, but there are all kinds of other cities. Now, I want to actually focus on a set of trends that are not necessarily connected, but that amount to something that I think we need to take into account, and that is a displacement of people. Now, a lot has been said about land grabs, especially in the global south. Here is some data. Since 2006, over 200 million hectares have been acquired by foreign investors in a growing number of countries. That includes, by the way, Europe. The measure that you see here is for parcels that are at least 200 hectares. So in the case of Europe, you have an undercount. But for instance, the nice firm that is H&M, a Swedish firm, um, has bought vast stretches of land in Northern England. The Mormons of Utah have bought land in Cambridgeshire, maybe because Utah is getting so dry that they want a bit of wetland 
and so they went to Cambridgeshire in the UK. And these are just unexpected uh, uh, findings, if you want, that concern Europe, besides Africa and Latin America and the more familiar countries. Now, here is a very different process. Anyhow, what I'm trying to say with these land grabs is when you buy 1.8 million hectares of land in Congo and another 2 million in Zambia to grow a plantation for palm, probably for palm for biofuels. What happens? You evict floras, faunas, villages, etc. That then feeds the urbanizing that takes mostly the form of shanties and slums. So today when I hear the term urbanization, I ask, what don't I see? when I just say urbanization. What I don't see are all those displaced people in rural areas. Here's another figure. These are foreclosures. This is the United States. 13 million households have been basically put out of their homes. Some might still be living there. That's about 30 million people invisible. That leaves, as I was already mentioned this morning, that leaves a lot of empty urban land. What's next? How can I not connect some of this with the active buying of urban land by other actors? This is Europe. Often people think that this cannot happen in Europe. Well, there it is. And look, these are foreclosures. And so they may or may not be out of their homes. And look, Germany is among the high level of foreclosures. These are invisible histories in these countries, which are also producing empty urban land. And even nice countries like Denmark, the Netherlands, they also have that. So we have a whole variety of movements. This, and I hope people can see it, this is investment by uh, all kinds of you know, national and foreign investors in cities. And uh, I hope you can see it, but when you take total investment, New York is the biggest. And I'll show you some other figures, but as you can see, it is a whole variety of cities that is involved. These are destinations for major investors. If you just take cross-border capital, in other words, foreign investors, well, I'm sorry, this is still more detailed. So what you see in New York, this is just one, no, 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 that's all right. I can, I can barely see it without my glasses. But so, so what you have here, look at, the, look at the figures. 55 billion in one year. London Metro, 47 billion. What does that mean at the level of actual implementation in the city? This is my concern. These are just the top 10, but the, we have data for 100, and the data come from a whole variety of sources. Now, if you just... And here is a larger list. These are the top 25 cities. And you see that at one point it sort of dribbles down and it's more or less everywhere fairly low, right? But this is just to give you a sense again of the diversity of cities involved and I hope you can read some of those. Now, if you just take cross-border, in other words, foreign investors, London, Paris are at the top. But again, if you looked at the whole list of 100 cities, you see it's a whole bunch of cities. And here you have a bit more detail. London Metro, 29 billion. New York Metro, 11. These are just foreign investors. Now, and here again, here you have the top 25 cities where you see a bit more, you know, a bit of more variation. Now, I just want to, for us to sort of focus, what does it mean when you have year after year this level of money coming into these cities. And again, there are a lot of smaller cities. I want to repeat that if you look at the total 100. Um, and the slides will be available if you're really interested in the full list of the 100. Now, again, the image is a mega project. That is one way of putting it. That really de-urbanizes urban space. Two concerns I have. One is, what does this mean for governance? The traditional, the typical, discourse on governance deals with a whole bunch of issues which matter, it does not deal with this. How do you govern this type of extraordinarily powerful insertions into your urban space? 
Secondly, and most important, the city. I think of the city as a very important type of space. It is not simply density. An office park is dense. It's not a city. Why does it matter to have cities? The city is a kind of complex but incomplete system. And in that mixture of complexity and incompleteness lies the capacity of cities to keep reinventing themselves across time, across different epochs. But also very important, the city is a place where those without power get to make a history, an economy, think of immigrant communities, a culture. The powerless would not make a history or anything else in an office park. Today, a lot of the discussion is about density. And we really need to differentiate. Now, these mega projects that investors are sort of, you know, inserting into cities produce density, but they also de-urbanize in that sense of the city that I just gave you. Now, here is a graph that you cannot possibly read. I mean, even if you try it. But I just want to to put it there because this describes, it gives you a sense of the number of cities and the number of different vectors through which these investments happen. So it's hotels, it's retail, it's apartment buildings, it's office buildings, it's all kinds of things. Excluded, by the way, from all of these data is the development of a site. So for instance, in New York, that is not included in these figures that I've shown you for New York. In New York, there is a vast stretch of land that is sort of partly industrial, partly uh, warehousing that is called Atlantic Yards in Brooklyn. Huge patch of land. Very sort of losing a lot of activity, so very sort of un under, underutilized. Well, one of the biggest companies of China just bought it. What are they going to do with it? It's a huge patch of land. They are going to build 14 mega apartment buildings. That will bring density, but not city. If you just have endless rows of housing, like the outside of Shanghai today, for instance, that is not urban. That is just one example of what is happening in these cities. Now here, here is yet another one of these graphs that are sort of endlessly. And so I want to, to sort of uh, begin to, to conclude with some thoughts about where we are at here. Um, again, when people talk about investment in investing in cities, developing sites, they do not talk about urban land we tend to think of, you buy urban land basically through buying buildings. When you buy it at that scale, you are buying urban land. When you add to that the foreclosures, the empty houses, empty neighborhoods, what are we seeing? And the other question that I would like to put and just give a quick answer is, why? Why this interest in buying so much urban buildings urban slash urban land. What is it? Same thing with rural land, by the way. The biggest buyers of rural land in 2006, when the crisis was emerging, were hedge funds. Goldman Sachs also bought land in Russia. JP Morgan bought land in Ukraine. That was a bit, uh, Ukraine was a bit more peaceful. Now, none of these were thinking of becoming farmers, right? That was not the plan. So the question is, why? I think this morning also in the, in the environmental discussion, I think that we are really dealing with a shrinking supply of land and of water. We know that the facts are there. It is truly disastrous. I must say that in this little book that I just did, the expulsion books, the chapter that excited me the most was one that I called Dead Land, Dead Water. We have vast stretches of debt. So there is that issue. There is the issue just of land. But I also think that there is the issue of what is uh, a good investment. And we're running out of good investments. So 
I would think that this business of buying buildings as a way of buying urban land to develop it, who knows how, can only grow. Back to the question of governance. What does that really mean for existing governance mechanisms? We really don't have a way of handling that. It's not part of the discussion. It's not, it's not something that people are debating because it is always put, when we're talking about cities, in terms of development. Now, development is truly an ambiguous term. And there are some very good things about it, but mostly I would say that it has produced some rather negative conditions. So I would, I would think that, and I would, it would be great if we could have a bit of a discussion about that at some point this afternoon. What does it mean to develop urban governance mechanisms that address this question of the buying of so many buildings, so much empty space, de facto so much urban land? What does that do to cities? And what does that do to what we have gained from cities, what matters, and it, again, to me especially, the fact that the powerless get to make a history in a city in a way that they could not in an office park. Thank you very much.